first paper I've got is one that, I mean, both these papers are ones that I wrote regarding church fellowship back in 2019. Uh, the second paper is more about where, when we're establishing church fellowship, where we draw the lines between breaking and staying united. Uh, this first one is more about the responsibility, the, the paper itself is titled The Responsibility of the Bearers of Truth. And the subtitle is Avoiding the Errors of Unionism and Sectarianism. So it is about what is our responsibility as, at least if we truly believe that we're preaching the truth, what is our responsibilities regarding those in error and basically trying to balance that fine line between being a unionist but also not falling off the other side of the horse and being a sectarian. So I'll just get underway with reading the paper now. So Holy Scripture tells us that we are only to share in fellowship with those um, who share with us in the same orthodox confession of faith. In regards to heterodox churches, Scripture gives the command that we should come out of her. Um, that quote's taken directly from Revelation, but I've got also references, verses here from Isaiah and 2 Corinthians. Um, within Lutheranism, there is often the problem of people continuing to have fellowship with heterodox church bodies and false teachers, despite their, refu their repeated refusal to repent. This is not right. As bearers of the true teachings of scripture, we have the duty to rebuke false teaching and to break fellowship with those who continue to teach falsely in unrepentance. In Matthew 18, 15 to 17, we are told how to handle a Christian brother who continues in unrepentant sin. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And in Titus 3, 9 to 11, Paul tells us to avoid false teachings. And as for the person who stirs up divisions through false teachings, we are to, after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with him. As the bearers of truth, we have a responsibility not to be bound together with falsities. For scripture warns us not to listen to those who teach falsely. Instead, we are to mark and avoid those who create division through the promotion of false teachings. And we are not to associate with those who hold to a heterodox confession of faith. We are told not even to eat with those, but to purge them from our midst. Now, this comment about eating is a reference to table or altar fellowship. Those who you eat with declares to the world those who you associate with. This principle applies not only to the general meal table, but especially to the Lord's table. Those with whom you commune are those with whom you associate with. Altar fellowship is church fellowship. We are not to associate with those who hold to a heterodox confession of faith. For those who associate with false teachers partake in their sins. See 2 John uh, verses 10 and 11. And the scriptures warn us not to partake in the sins of others. See 1 Timothy chapter 5, 22. Therefore, we have a responsibility to flee from the heterodox teachers and from heterodox church bodies and not to fall into this era of unionism. However, within Lutheranism, there is also an equally serious error that we should avoid. Very often people are so eager to flee false teachings that they do also break fellowship too hastily and they do not seek reconciliation. Scripture does teach us to break fellowship with those who continue in unrepented error, but at the same time, Scripture urges us to walk in humility and gentleness with patience, bearing one another in love, being eager to maintain unity. We are to be patient with our Christian brothers when they are caught up in sin. We are to rebuke them and call them to repentance, but we should also restore them through gentleness, bearing one another's burdens. We are to preach the true word of God, but we are to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with patience and careful instruction. For our opponents must be corrected with gentleness, so that God may grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth, so that they may come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil. We are to preach the truth in love, so that the body of Christ may grow and be built up in love. 
Violet is always important to seek the true teachings of God's word. It is also important to seek unity. However, I am not saying that we should do away with all divisions so that we can all belong to one big happy church. For there must be divisions among us in order that those who are genuine may be recognized. But as the bearers of truth, we do have the responsibility to restore our fallen brothers through patience and gentleness rather than simply breaking fellowship with them straight away. This does not mean that we should sever all contact with those in error and never talk to them again. Yet scripture, yes, scripture does tell us that we should have nothing to do with them, that we are not to greet them or eat with them. But this is in regard to fellowship, that we do not welcome them into our churches to preach or to teach or to administer communion or to commune with us. We do not have church fellowship with those in error. But this does not mean that we cannot still have dialogue with them. Um, good point is this conference itself. None of us are in fellowship because we believe that to some degree the other person is in some sort of error, yet we're still able to gather today and talk. Um, we are to break fellowship with those in error, but we shouldn't regard them as enemies for they too are still brothers in Christ. If people are open to change and willing to engage in dialogue, then we should be willing to dialogue with them. We are all sinners and we can all err. And if we have erred, then let those errors be shown to us using scripture and plain reason. In dialogue, we must be open to being proved wrong if we have erred, but we must also maintain the goal to seek reconciliation, agreement, and to eventually bring our erring brother to the truth. Many Lutherans these days cease fellowship too quickly. Um, sorry, they, they cease dialogue too quickly for the fear of endless debates. Many will argue that we've debated this topic in the past or we just can't come to agreement. So there's no point talking about it anymore. But this does not mean that we have to completely cease dialogue with other churches. As the bearers of truth, we have the responsibility to preach truth to those in error with the hope of bringing them to the truth. Now, this may fail time and time again, but as long as we are willing to have dialogue with them, we continue to work together preaching the truth with the hope that eventually our brothers will be brought to the truth. Now, I like to refer to what I call the first Corinthians seven principle. So in first Corinthians seven, Paul speaks about Christians who are married to non-Christian spouses. And he says, if the non-Christian spouse consents to staying married, then the two of you should remain married. In doing so, there is the hope that the non-Christian spouse may be won over to the faith. However, if the non-Christian spouse separates, then there is really nothing he can do since the non-Christian won't listen to the law of God regarding marriage and they'll just leave. And then the Christian spouse is free to remarry. Now, in the same way, when it comes to church dialogue, those who are the bearers of truth have the responsibility to continue in dialogue as long as those in error are willing to continue the dialogue. As the bearers of truth, you are obligated to speak the truth. In doing so, there is the hope that you may bring your fallen brothers to a fuller knowledge of truth and free them from their error. But if they do not want to dialogue with you, then let them go their own way and you are free from your responsibility to talk to them. For in Ezekiel chapter 3, 17 to 21 and Ezekiel 33, 7 to 9, scripture says that we are to warn those who are in error. We are told that if we do not warn them and they die in their sins, then their blood is on our hands. But if we do warn them and yet they remain unrepentant, then their blood is on their own hands and we are innocent of their blood. If a righteous person falls into sin and you fail to rebuke him, he will die in his sin and his blood is on his own hands. Oh, is on sorry, his blood is on your hands. But if you warn him and he repents, then you have saved your brother. Therefore, if those in error are willing to listen to you and you do not attempt to dialogue with them, then their blood is on your hands if they continue in their error. You have the responsibility to preach the truth to them. And if you are given the opportunity to do so, you should do so. 
if you don't have the opportunity because they do not want to talk to you, then that is their fault and you are innocent of that. But if you are open to dialogue, no, sorry, if you're open to dialogue and they are not, then as the book of Ezekiel teaches, they have the law of God and it is their own fault if they continue in their own sin. So if those churches in error are willing to listen to you, then you should engage with them in dialogue. Whether they repent or not, whether they agree with you or not, whether we should always continue to take this opportunity to preach the truth as long as people are willing to listen. But if those in error don't want to dialogue with us, if they want to cut all ties with us and, and ignore us because we're small churches and we have broken fellowship with them, then that is on them. If they will not listen, then we should treat them as unbelievers and to have nothing to do with them. We should shake the dust from our feet and speak with them no longer. We should not we should always try to avoid falling into the errors of unionism and continuing to have fellowship with those in error, while at the same time we need to avoid the error of sectarianism where we just shut ourselves off and never talk to anyone ever again because, well, they're all in error, so there's no point talking to them. We need to rebuke, in, we need to rebuke error, but we need to do so in love and in gentleness. We should divide from error but do so patiently. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We need to love one another as Christ has loved us. And this means that we need to be like God, slow to anger, but abounding in love. And that ends my paper. So I will now open up the floor for you guys for any further comments, questions, criticisms, um, etc. So. Just unmute yourselves and talk away. And if you just give me a moment, I'm just going to quick shut my door. Thanks, Jake, for your paper. And um, very, I think, very well presented. Um, could you speak? Well, sorry, I'm back in. The, the um, kind of tricky point, I think, for anyone trying to practice church fellowship correctly, and this is not a this is kind of one of the a side point, um, mm -hmm. but just as you were as you presented your paper, the thing I thought of <laughs> is um, to not eat with. Um, uh, there's the practice of shunning that uh, is practiced among the Jehovah's Witnesses and among um, Amish Mennonites, right, and legalists um, and. Yeah, those who yeah they kind of those who are working their way to heaven. Uh, I think practice shunning. Um, do you think Paul was talking about uh, yeah the when when he said that uh, that he was talking about like those who are um, actively trying to to seduce like believers into false doctrine and that not not talking about everybody that because that's that's my view. Do you? I don't know. Do you agree with that? That it's not anybody who uh, leaves the church is not, you can still talk to them. It's, but it's those who are actively trying to undermine the gospel. That's when you, we you wouldn't even eat with someone. Well, with like what I, I kind of covered in my paper is the, the not eating part. And I've had other pastors point, talk to me about this, where they say it's not eating in reference to like the everyday meal, but it is just in reference to the communion table. And the, the main two points to that is the section about not eating is comes from 1 Corinthians 5. There were Paul's talking about this, um, this member of the church who's um, having sex with his uh, stepmother. And, and Paul tells him to do away with him, to kick him out of the church, not to eat with him. And uh, Martin Kevnitz brings this up as his Enchiridion about excommunication from the church. So he, um, Martin Kevnitz has connected that verse to excommunicating people from the communion table. So I think that's how a lot of, at least historically, people have read that verse from Paul, that when he says don't eat with people, he's not taking it to the full extent of, you know, you're not allowed to have a meal with somebody, that he's meaning more don't don't have communion with them that's that's kind of the historical way 
Lutherans have interpreted that verse. It's similar to how I also mentioned the don't greet people. That's, that one also comes from Second John, where he's talking about the false teachers coming to the churches, and he's saying, well, don't, don't greet them, because um, anyone who uh, partake, you know, who welcomes the false teacher partakes in their error. And again, the, the way I've seen that verse interpreted is not again like I can't say hello to an unbeliever because again, if that was the case, then how would we ever convert anyone to to Christianity if we just can't even say hello to somebody? But Paul, um, Paul in John, John's talking more about welcoming in teachers into your churches and that would be in regards to like the idea of pulpit fellowship don't don't greet false teachers and welcome them into your church as teachers so it's less more of the actual full hardcore shunning that like the jehovah's and the amish and those like to do and more of a not having altar and pulpit and worship fellowship with those in error um that that's at least the way i've not only Again, like I don't want to say I've interpreted those verses, but how I've seen other people interpret those verses. Like I say, Chemnitz interpreted 1 Corinthians 5 in regards to communion fellowship rather than just, you know, day-to-day -day meals. So, yeah. I suppose that would tie up really well with being a good steward of the mysteries. Mm, definitely. You don't want to... Uh, give communion to those that you know are in error because i mean well that's the part our communion is for the forgiveness of sins and if people are in unrepentant error well they, they shouldn't be coming to receive communion um yeah any any other further comments or questions before we move on to daniel and his paper no all right well let, we'll I let daniel i will just comment um the Yep. I, the, it's the first time I've heard anyone apply the Christian spouse example to um, fellowship. It's it's not a yeah, it's that's interesting. I've never heard that applied before. Um, I think it's that's one I'll I'll think about because um, there's this is uh, that this is kind of the thing, isn't it? Like. Um, do you stay in the hopes of um, of influencing somebody and leading them to the gospel, or do you break so as to um, give them a, a warning and a let them know that this? Is I know the the analogy. I mean, the analogy kind of it does fail in the fact that within the marriage situation they stay married. So that would be more like encouraging people to stay in a heterodox church body, uh, which is actually counter to the point I was trying to make where I was trying to encourage people to get out of a heterodox church body. I, I you know, like I go, the, 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 it's not a one-to-one -one parallel. The main kind of point I was just trying to get from there is that I was, I was connecting it less the marriage and fellowship and marriage and dialogue. That it's the idea of as long as somebody's willing to talk to you, you should talk with them. Now I have heard people before, because I've, I've talked about this before with people, I've heard people say, yeah, but like the Bible says, don't throw your pearls before swine and stuff like that. So they say, well, you don't just keep wasting your time with people. And I go, yeah, I think there is sometimes you have to say, no, this just isn't worthwhile and you have to just stop dialogue. But I think there is a difference between like, why, why are you doing that? Is it because like, you're trying and they're deliberately not trying like they they're just getting together with you to talk just to basically stir you up well in that case then don't bother talking to them if they're just going to use it to create more fights and arguments then then don't chat with them but if they're actually being genuine and are wanting to sit down and discuss theology and stuff with you well then take the opportunity i mean don't 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 give up an opportunity to to preach the gospel and to preach the truth yeah, it's a good good passage to bring up, um, and that's a that's a difficult one. Uh, but and the in, I'll just say before I start my paper, the interesting thing about that passage: uh, do not cast your per, uh, do not throw what is holy to the dogs, or cast your pearls before swine, for they will trample you and take your pearls. The um, that's an extremely difficult passage to use to put into to say this passage applies here, 
because it has no literal meaning. There's no explanation of it. Who are the, who are the dogs? What are, what are, what is the, what is holy? Okay. You have to define everything before you can apply that passage. And I think that's intentional on the Lord's part, um, that he, he wants to make it difficult to be able to say, this person is the dog and the swine. Well, maybe I should take the plank out of my own eye and, um, first and see, have I, has, you know, yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying.